break away from our series in Matthew, and we'll pick it up in a couple of weeks, Matthew chapter 19, but this morning we want to look at Isaiah chapter 40. I want to read verses 25 through 31, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25 through, uh, through 31. And every now and then I get an urge to try to go back and look at another a text for a second time to take another swing at it. Amen. Take, take one more cut at it. Amen? Amen. Isaiah chapter, 20, uh, chapter 40, look at verse 25. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number, who calls them by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by me. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? There's no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall fail and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. May the Lord's richest blessing be to his word, may it be sanctified in our hearts. Let's bow for prayer. Shall we, Father, we're so grateful for another opportunity to gather together around your word with the precious people and the friends of the Grace Bible Church. We pray that the Holy Spirit will fall fresh upon us as a congregation, upon the congregation as the hearers, the receivers of your word today, that their ears might be open, their hearts might be inclined, their, their minds might be energized to do the Lord's word. Speak a good word through your servant today. Give him the knowing, the clarity of thought clear articulation of words that your holy word will be able to be communicated to your people. It pleases you to open the eyes of that man, that woman, that boy, that girl that will come to faith in Christ. They might believe today and trust Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. We give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, and I want to speak this morning just briefly from the subject of why you should wait on the Lord. Why you should wait on the Lord. We live in a fast-paced world. And I'm sometimes amazed, how did we function as a society? How did we function as human beings? Without all of these luxuries that we now had at our disposal, that enables us to do things much faster than what we used to do them. How do we survive without a cell phone? I mean, how do we survive without cell phones? And there was a time when, you know, I mean, been that long that cell phones been invented. There was a time that many of us grew up in neighborhoods where everybody didn't even have a house phone. And the few people that had a house phone, they had a party line. So you couldn't talk when you wanted to talk because if somebody else was on the line, you couldn't get on the line, they got off the line. There might be four or five people on one line. And you eavesdrop on people's conversations and trying to insult people. You know, how, how do we make it without cell phones? And there used to be a time there wasn't even a, a pay phone on every corner. I mean, they were few and far between, a pay phone. And you had to have a, a dime to even use the pay phone. 
Do they still have pay phones? I, I don't even know that I've even seen a pay phone. I guess there's probably a few somewhere, right? So something like this, how in the world did we survive without a cell phone? How do we survive without a microwave? Can you imagine not having a microwave to actually have to get a pot to put the food in it to warm it up? How do we survive without microwaves? How do we survive without microwave popcorn? I love popcorn, man. But everybody can't cook popcorn. Not without the microwave. How many can really cook popcorn without the microwave? There ain't but a few people that can do it. Ain't but a few people ever done it before. There's a skill. There's an art to cooking popcorn. You got to get the right amount of lard and the right amount of butter and the right amount of popcorn in the pot. And you got to be right there watching it. And you have to have the skill and the dexterity to be able to move it back and forth across the fire while it's popping. Otherwise, it'll burn at the bottom. See, y'all don't know nothing about this. Y'all couldn't eat popcorn in the house if it wasn't a microwave. And I find myself sometimes in such a hurry, standing in front of the microwave, wondering why it's taking so long. <laughs> why is it taking so long to cook my food? Or warm it up. My wife's already cooked all I got to do is warm it up. A minute at the most, maybe a minute and 30 seconds. And so I'm so impatient, I will put the button on a minute and 30, and now I go off and do something else. I ain't got time for you to wait on it. And then forget how to put the food in the microwave. <laughs> then it get cold. Now I got to warm it up. Again, now I'm just, I'm just nuking. I mean, all the nutrients and all the, I'm just drying it totally out completely because of my impatience. We are conditioned to be impatient. We live in an instant world. How many of y'all actually perk coffee? We got time to perk no coffee. We don't want instant coffee. Now I grew up, my, mom, my grandma had this old raggedy coffee pot. She liked to perk it. She liked to smell it. And to this day, I love the smell of perk coffee. I hate the taste of it. You can't hardly give it to me. I'm going to put about two or three spoons of sugar in it, some some cream or something, some milk, almost at the end, it's gonna be like syrup by the time I finish. Love the smell of it. Can't figure out how people can develop a taste for it. We ain't even got time to enjoy the aroma of coffee perking. We got in a hurry to get it. We gotta have that, that caffeine hit, we want it quick. We're in a hurry. So being in a hurry sometimes robs us of a of a trait, of a, it's a skill, it's a discipline that used to be common when life was simpler, life was slower. It was called meditation. It was called reflection. People would read and they would sit there and think about what they had read. People would keep diaries and write down their daily thoughts about how they felt that day and if they were Christians, how they could see the, the move of the hand of God. Most of us don't have time to keep a diary. We don't have time to journal. We ain't too big of a hurry. Even though we have word processing where we could do a lot faster. So we're losing this art, this discipline of meditation, of reflection, thinking about where I've come from and where God has brought me from, where I am now, where might God be leading me, and am I open and sensitive to the leading of the Lord? There's one person that we can't rush, and that's the Lord our God. He operates on his own timetable, on his own schedule. He does things when, where, and how he thinks it needs to be done. Because he knows exactly what we're ready for, what we aren't ready for. He knows if we give us certain things prematurely, we're going to eat ourselves to death, ride ourselves to death, cook ourselves to death, dress ourselves to death. We're going to do something in excess that we shouldn't do. So he holds it back from us. That we might learn the discipline and the art of waiting on the Lord. I'm not going to be long. I just want to kind of survey this 40th chapter of Isaiah because the whole 31 verses and the first 24 verses actually lead up to those last five or six verses or so. 
But the chapter answers the simple question, why you should do what you don't want to do, and by nature that you rebel against, and that you are repulsed at doing, and that's waiting, and that's being patient. So Isaiah's going to make the argument of why you should wait on the Lord. The first point I see he makes is early in those verses. He says you ought to wait on the Lord for his forgiveness. You ought to wait on his forgiveness. He opens up by saying, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so now Isaiah the prophet is saying to the nation of Israel, God has forgiven you. As a matter of fact, God is going to give you double blessing for the sins that you have committed. He's chastened you and he's punished you. And there are times that we have to wait on the Lord to actually sense and feel God's forgiveness. You know, the things we do that scars us emotionally and psychologically, spiritually and mentally, it was a serious breach against ourselves. And many people live with the, the guilt and the shame of past transgressions, of past actions that doesn't easily go away. But by faith, if we keep believing what God has said, if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we believe that and trust the Lord with that, even when we don't feel like we're forgiven, if we just keep trusting and waiting on God, then God in his own time will bring that release, that liberation we need to sense and to feel. We are forgiven because God has promised it. But sometimes because of how deeply we were wounded or wounded ourselves by violating our own code of conduct, it's hard for us to believe that God could forgive us because in our humanity, we can only go so far with forgiveness. We go so far with it, but God starts where we end in our acts of forgiveness. And if you wait on him, you're going to experience it and feel it and sense the fact that God has indeed Cast your sins into the sea of forgiveness to remember them no more. Some things only materializes over time. They can overstreet. We just got to wait. We got to see it out. Like the old folk used to say, I'm just going to stay right here at the morning bench until my chains come. I'm going to keep trusting the Lord until the chains come that I want to see come in my life. The second reason Isaiah said we're to wait on the Lord, we're to wait on him so that we can see his return. He's coming back, verses 4 and 5. He's coming back. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked places made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see her together, for the, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. Martin Luther King didn't write that. Y'all know that? He always quoted that. That was one of his favorite quotes that he would give in many of his speeches, but it comes right out of the text. And so in many of King's speeches, he would leave the earthly and he would start being prophetic because he understood the dilemma that we face can only be rectified and corrected with the coming of the Lord. So he would quote this particular passage from Isaiah chapter 40. The crooked place is going to be made straight. Every eye shall see him. And so the longing and the yearning of us as believers is to see the return of Jesus Christ when he cracks the eastern skies and returns in all of his majesty and his splendor and glory. And so we wait on him. We wait on him. And we wait not only for his second advent for him to come, physically and literally, but we also have to wait for his manifestation in time. We wait for him to manifest himself in time. We can go these long stretches, Smith sisters, these long periods of praying and of singing and nothing seems to change, Sister Jones, but we just keep singing and we keep praying and we keep trusting because we're longing for the Lord to return and manifest himself so we can see his glory. And we got to wait on it. 
I, I, I wish I had time to testify this morning, but I, I really don't have time to testify, but I'll just give you a brief little excerpt of how the Lord works. Now, my wife and I get invited to do this wedding for this family that I barely know. But I did something for this prayer every year for this lady, for the homeless, when she has this big meal cooked. Her daughter was a little girl growing up. Now she's a grown woman, get, uh, finishing her medical school, doing her residency. And of all the preachers that she could have asked, she asked me to come to do this wedding. And so we met with her and her, 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 her husband. Now her husband met with her mom. They had this big wedding plan. And they on this big plantation. It's acres and acres of land. It's cattle. It's God's country. It's as far as you can see. Nothing but beautiful land. And we're walking around up there, and, and, and I came. We went up for the rehearsal and yesterday for the wedding. And so when my wife and I got there, you know, my wife is a stickler for everything, been balanced and straight. She noticed something was out of place. And so I go up, and I go up to kind of fix the outside, and they got this uh, this motif of being on this farm because they all, they're all on the farm and they had these barrels up there where uh, under the arch where the wedding party would stand. And one of them, so I went up there and saw to me, everybody was looking at me. I, everybody was looking. These about 200, 250 people. Doctors and lawyers and nurses and Indian chiefs and accountants and, and bankers. And, 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 and there just wasn't a lot of people. As a matter of fact, there was nobody up there that had a suntan like my wife and I, but my wife and I. If you understand what I'm saying. And so they were looking, what, what is he doing? Moving stuff and, and changing stuff around. And they had the microphone set up. And I went over to the person with the sound system. I said, we can't have all this apparatus up here in front of this bride and this groom. Y'all get this stuff out of here. Just give me the handheld mic. And when they want to talk, I'll put the mic on the talk. What, what is he doing? So I, I walked toward the back. And I wish I could have taken a picture. When I walked into the front, and grabbed the microphone, and I said, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to welcome you to the black and the best wedding. I'm Pastor Matthew J. Watts. I will be the official of the day's wedding event. <laughs> it, was, it was something to behold, right? Uh, but they received as well a marvelous day. But here's the point. People that I don't even know, some of the most powerful people that are related to powerful people in this town, I connected these doctors and these lawyers, and they were all there. And I never met them before. And they came up to talk to me about things that's happening in the city of Charleston and say, this isn't right, and this not fair, and we know what's going on here, and we think we might be able to help. And I told my wife, only God could do that. Only God could actually get me somewhere out of this town because I've been looking for the reasonable people. I've been trying to find them. Where are the reasonable people? Where are the fur and the just people? And here God takes us all the way out of Charleston, clear up into uh, White Sulphur Springs on a mountain in the middle of nowhere, and he assembles together some of the most powerful people that's associated with powerful people down here to come to say, what happened to you guys is not fair. It was miraculous. Just waiting on the Lord. And the Lord will manifest himself in places where you don't expect him to show up. And God knows people that you don't know that he knows. And there are people that you don't know that God knows and knows God. And some of those people are looking at things and they say, you know what, that's not right. We wait on him. For his forgiveness, we wait on him for his return. We wait on him for his manifestation. And we wait on him for his revelation of his word. Verse 6, the voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is as grass, and all is loveless like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it, verse 7. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. We wait on the Lord, and we ought to wait on him for a rhema word, for a specific word, for a specific revelation. God and sundry times in the old times and in many different ways spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he's spoken unto us by his son, Jesus Christ, who in the brightness of his glory, the exact representation of his person, who by himself has purged us of our sins, sat there at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. We wait on God to hear a word from God. God still speaks. God is not silent. God is not mute. God is not stuttered. God does not have a speech impediment. God is speaking still with perennial freshness in and through his word and through the situation of life if we would wait on him. 
for his forgiveness, for his return, for his manifestation, revelation, for his word. Fourthly, we should wait on him to see his power on display. Look at verse 9. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into a high mountain, O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice and strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God, behold the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them into his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Who measure the waters in the hollow of his hand, measure the heaven with a span, and calculate the dust of the earth in a measure. This God you serve is so magnificent, he's so grand, he's so powerful, he is so all-knowing that he has calculated how much dust there is on the earth. Only God. And we should wait on him to manifest himself in power. Many of us as preachers, we are preaching about God as if he was this very powerful individual back in antiquity. In the good old days when God was still reverenced. In the good old days when God was still revered. In the good old days when people still believed in God. In the Bible days, we will say, when Jesus walked on the earth, God could do great things. He could open eyes that were blind. He could loose ears that could not hear. He could loose tongues that could not speak. He would heal leprous bodies. He could heal atrophied limbs. That was the God of the past. But the God of the nuanced present is somewhat limited by our current standards of progressive thought. And so we preach about a God of antiquity. Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy about the God that we preach about now and about what the, where the church is. He said that it will have a form of godliness. Religious sound in sermons, religious sound in music, religious sound in prayers, a form of godliness, but it denies the very power of God, this transcendent power to do exceedingly great and marvelous and wonderful things in our time and in our midst. I just thought about to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if the God of David, if the God of the children of Israel, if that God has lost some of his power, we are in a world of trouble. We are in a world of trouble. The distress that exists all over the nation, the, the social and the political unrest all over the world, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction from nuclear weapons and chemical weapons and biological weapons, unstable leaders all over the world, climate that's out of control, the, the, the earth is groaning in birth pain. If God can't stop some of this stuff, we're in trouble. We have trouble. Whether you believe in global warming or not believe in global warming, something is happening in the atmosphere. Something is happening in the elements. How many floods can we withstand? How many hurricanes can we withstand? And we're not talking about earthquakes yet. They've taken a brief respite. If God is not God and if God doesn't have power, we are in a world of trouble. An opioid drug addiction problem that is destroying cities all over the United States of America and the state of West Virginia is ground zero for the highest death from opioid-based drugs in the United States of America. The highest percentage of people owning them and taking them and using them and people on the highway driving vehicles and motorized things high out of their mind. If God is not God that can protect us on these highways and on these roads, we are in a world of trouble. So we better start preaching about a God and believing in a God that is bigger than opioid drug addiction, that is bigger than the crime and violence that is running rampant in many of our cities and on our streets, a God that is able to arrest some of these parents to their responsibility to raise their children because we're raising these people that are doing weird and strange things. Most of them didn't come from another country. They're homebred. They're homebred and homeborn and home raised. If God is not a God of power, we're in a world of trouble. 
So we wait on him to see his strength, and we keep talking about it when we don't see it. We keep believing it when it's not readily visible. We see things that are invisible, we hear things that are inaudible, and we believe things that appear to be impossible because we know that we need a move of Almighty God. And I don't know about you, but you might think you can sing your way through the trials and the tribulations of life. And you might think on your own prayers that's enough to get you through. And you might make a good sermon every now and then, but I'm telling you, we need to grab hold of the arms of God altar. We need to experience and encounter the living God. And every now and then, we need to be able to see something that reminds us of his power. And we are reminded that he is still the God of strength and power. I'm almost through. We wait on him because of his forgiveness. We wait on him for his return, his manifestation. We wait on him because we need the word of the Lord. We need the word of the Lord. Man and women and boys and girls should not live by bread alone in video games and Facebook and Twitter, all by themselves and McDonald's and Wendy's. Oh, man and women can't live on that alone. We need the word of God, that word that feeds our souls and our spirit, that word that touches our minds and helps us keep our sanity, that word that balances us psychologically where we don't go out and get AK-27 with the bumps on it and go out and shooting people. That word that keeps us balanced and keep on trying to do all the good that we can do regardless of how we are treated. We need the word of the Lord. And because we need that word that reminds us of God's strength and God's power, and things are never out of his control. So we wait on him. Verse 13 and 14, we wait on him because of his wisdom. The counsel of the Lord abides forever. The thoughts of his generations, to every, of his heart, to every generation, Psalm 33, 11. We need the wisdom of God. All the depths of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how Unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. We need the wisdom of God. Human wisdom is not enough. We got more PhD people in the United States of America. We still got the best universities in the world. Still got the best university system in the United States and in, in the whole world. That's why everybody trying to get over here to go to our universities. To study in our medical schools. Because we have the best at producing that. But it's not enough. We still can't cure cancer. We still can't do nothing with Alzheimer's. We spend millions, maybe even billions, trying to find all these. We still can't cure a common cold. We can't cure a common cold. I'm on my second antibiotic trying to get rid of this bronchitis. Went through one last week, and I was like the woman with the issue of blood. I didn't get better, but I got worse. So then Doc called in one and said, well, now you got to take two of these for 10 days. And so the one was one for one day. So I got all this antibiotic coming out of me. Every, any fluid that comes in my body, I can smell the antibiotic coming out of me. With all this genius that we have, medicine only works if God says so. Amen. It only helps if God says so. Yeah. We got anesthesiology to put you to sleep. You don't wake up unless God say so. You know, I'm not a good medicine taker, you know. And I had this bad cough. You know, my problem is I read too much stuff. You see, back in the, back in the early 1900s, uh, one of the leading causes of death in the United States of America was coughing. Coughing to kill you. I asked the doctor back there. It just traumatizes the body. And so that's why back in the early 1900s, we got a lot of people got hooked on the opioid-based drugs because they put them in these medications to try to suppress the cough, to keep people from coughing to death. And so I was coughing so bad I couldn't hardly go to sleep, so Dr. Stanton prescribed me this, this cough medicine that had some codeine in it. The first time he gave it, I didn't take it. And he said, well, just take a couple teaspoons before you go to bed. Don't take no other time so you can get some sleep. So I took it, Sister Smith, because I couldn't go to sleep. I'm just hacking and coughing. So I took it. When I woke up the next day, I might as well have been comatose. I ain't remember nothing. I ain't dream nothing. I ain't wake up in the middle of the night to do nothing like I normally do. And I said, there's something that powerful. I took two teaspoons of it, put my head down on the pillow, and I was past La La Land. This is some powerful stuff here. 
I could see how people could get addicted to something that's this powerful. And I wasn't feeling no pain. I just went off to sleep, was what I'm trying to tell you. But it won't work if God don't say so. Because doctors are always practicing medicine. <laughs> They're always practicing medicine. They practice on the rats and the mice. They practice in the laboratory, and now they got to practice on us. So they take your body size and your weight and your age and your blood pressure and, and, and your vitals, and they prescribe something to practice on you, hoping that it help you, that it don't kill you. It only helps you if God says so. And that's why every time you take a pill, you say, blessed Lord. Blessed to the health and strength of my body. Please don't let this take me out of here. The wisdom of the Lord. That's what we pray for our physicians. We pray for those in the medical care field. They have life and death in their hands. They can't have too many bad days. They have bad days, somebody dies. You know that, how much pressure that is? How much pressure there is that you're going to put somebody to sleep and you got to make sure that somebody else you're directing to operate everything, know what they're doing, they're not out of their mind because that person can go to sleep and be comatose or go to sleep and sleep all out into eternity. That's a lot of pressure. You know, the pressure that Dr. Stanton is under when he's going in there and putting stents in people's heart, that's a lot of pressure to live with every single day. And that's why we should pray for him. God give them that extra bit of wisdom that they only can get because they know him and have the Holy Spirit and are open to God's direction and God's unction just at that moment in time to do the right thing. Well, let me wrap this up. We should wait on because of his forgiveness, wait on for his return, his manifestation, wait because we need a word from God to live in time, wait on him to see his strength and his power unveiled that encourages our souls and our spirit, wait on him because we need God's wisdom just in the daily routine things of life. We've got to make hundreds of split-second decisions, and we need the Lord's wisdom to do that. We wait on him to see his greatness. Verses 15 through 24, I don't have time to, to read all of that, but I'll read a couple first. And behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket, and are counted as small dust on the balance. Look, he lifts up the aisles as, as, as a very little thing, and leaven is not sufficient to burn, nor to be sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are nothing, and they are counted for him less than nothing and worthless. There's nothing God needs on this earth to make him more God. Right. Nothing that adds to his divine stature. Nothing that elevates his glory. We are his creation. We owe our existence to him. He's the great God. He's the God all by himself. Who can we compare him to? Who is he like, verse 18? The workman's mold, graven in the goldsmith overspeds with gold. The silversmith cast silver chains and Whatever is too impoverished for such a contribution. There's nothing like him. Have you not known, verse 21, have you not heard? Has not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and, inhabits, and its inhabitants on the earth are like grasshoppers. And let me close. Why should we wait on him? Because we need our strength to be renewed. I remember watching a movie several years. It was entitled Bell, B-E-L-L. -L. You can go and check it out on Netflix. Powerful movie based on a true story. A powerful movie based on a true story. And you watch it. There's a scene in this movie where this judge who is Bell's, this beautiful young lady's surrogate father, but he's really her uncle, and, and he's talking to this young attorney, and it's during the time that uh, slavery is still the institution in Great Britain, and it's starting to percolate in the court system whether or not it should be continued to be allowed. And he is the head, so like over the Supreme Court, he's going to make this very important decision that, that may dismantle uh, the slave institution. And his young surrogate daughter slash niece 
she's biracial, her father from this distinguished family, her mother was a slave woman. He's raised her as his own daughter, and he loves her dearly because he and his wife had no biological daughters, so he's raised these two nieces as his own daughters. And now she has fallen in love, heads and heels, with this young abolitionist attorney who's trying to use the power of the court to move the most powerful nation in the world, Great Britain, to force them to come to grips with this evil institution. And so she clandestinely is taking things from her uncle's office about the court proceedings and giving it to this young attorney so he can help to make his case together. And the judge realizes what's happening and he, he feels somewhat betrayed, but he knows that she's driven by pure motives. So there's this powerful scene where he's, he's talking to this young attorney. And he says to him, he says, young man, the world is a devastating place. It's a devastating place. And he says, if you don't learn to control your emotions and passions, it will devastate you. And I thought about that. The world is a devastating place. And the world it pulls out of her certain emotions and certain passions that we can't control. Only God can help us manage and control our emotions and our passions so that we are not devastated by the world. Only God can help us put things in the context and see that God is at work in a continuum and that every generation will have its issues and will have its challenges and there will be these injustices that God will want his people to respond to. But there's never any guarantee that your efforts will make that much of a difference in your lifetime. But God in his own time will bring to pass the justice that only God can bring forth when as the prophet wrote, there one will come a day when justice will roll down like mighty waters and righteousness not going to ever low and flood. So why we should wait on him? Because we need our strength to be renewed. Verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? He never faints, nor is he weary, and there's no searching of his understanding. Have you not heard, have you not known that God never suffers from fatigue? That God never suffers from insomnia? That God is never so sleep deprived that he might make a mistake or that he might miss something? Don't you know he's the everlasting God that never slumbers, that never sleeps, that always keeps his watch over you? And as the poor would always say, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but the scaffold sways the future, and yet beyond in the dim and dark unknown, there standeth God, keeping watch over his own. Have you not heard, have you not known, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, never faints, knows he weary, knows no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the weak, and that's why you have to wait on him. When you come to the end of your rope, when the spiritual monkey is on your back, when you are spiritually, when you are physically, psychologically, and emotionally fatigued, when you think that you're going to collapse under the weight of life's burdens, wife, life's concerns, and life's worries, he says God gives power to the weak. He gives power to the weak. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I pray to God three times to take away this thorn in my flesh. A, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. And he says, every time I prayed, the Lord said no. And Paul said, I prayed again. And on the third thing, the time, the Lord said to me, no, no, Paul. I'm not going to take that thorn of flesh away. I'm not going to take it away because my power is perfected in your weakness. My power is perfected in your weakness. And so Paul say, I would rather rejoice in tribulation if it means that God gives me more power to keep me alive in my weakness. If it means that God gives me more strength to keep me moving when I'm fatigued. If it means that God shows up and gives me another uh, little 
surge of energy when I think I'm going to collapse, I will rejoice in being weak because when I'm weak and not dependent on my own strength, my own power, my own source of energy, when I'm dependent on God, that's when I'm strong. Because God's power is full octane. It has not been watered down. One more thing and I'm done. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases the strength. Even you shall fail and, and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord, it's a virtue to wait. It's a virtue to trust in God. It's a display of faith, and God will never point, disappoint your faith. Faith will always be rewarded. It will always be rewarded. And it may be rewarded just when you think you're going to collapse, but God will never allow faith to go unrewarded. So he says, if you wait on the Lord, he's going to renew your strength. You're going to mount up wings like eagles. You're going to run and not be weary. You're going to walk and not faint. Do you feel tired? Do you feel weary? Do you feel like you're at the point of exhaustion? All I got to say to you is, is wait on the Lord. He'll renew your strength. Do you feel like you're the end of your rope? All I can say to you is tie a knot and hold on to the knot and wait on the Lord. He shall renew your strength. And he will show up when he should show up. And he will show up and he will also show out. Reverend, Reverend Stevens is helping me here. Bless you, brother. Ben Tolley used to do that all the time. Matter of fact, half of my sermons came from that bench right there. As I would start a text, B would finish it. Be encouraged, my beloved. When you think you're weak and you're trusting God, that's when you're strong. Because in your weakness, his strength is protected. Amen? Let's bow for prayer, shall we?